You're listening to The Science of CX. My name is Steve Pappas. I'm known for my relentless pursuit of all things customer. Across my career, and also in my six startups, I've had to learn how to make decisions in business that customers really respond to. Let's spend some time together and help your business soar, grow, and accelerate. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Science of CX. My name is Steve Pappas, and I'll be your host for this episode. One of the things that I get often asked around customer experience is, how do we identify where all the potential leaks are in CX? You know, where where is the where are the problem areas? Where are the things that that we should concentrate on as far as how to figure out is this something that is susceptible to CX problems? So what I did was I've uh, over the years I've put together various buyer process. Uh, diagrams, almost a mind map, if you will, and and I'll I'll even allow you to download uh, a, an example of it too. But in thinking about this and, and answering this question, where are the potential CX leaks? Well, I guess you really need to figure out what is your typical buyer's process. So, understanding what the traditional buyer process is, and then maybe tweaking it for your reality. So if you think about buyer's processes, many of them have been categorized over the years, and they usually break down into various stages. So those stages usually look like one is problem recognition, two is an information search that the buyer then you know, goes on some type of a search. Three would be an evaluation of what are all the options. Four could be the purchase decision uh, itself. And then five will be the actual transaction of the purchase. And then six is usually something around a post-purchase evaluation. Did it meet my needs, et cetera, et cetera. I've always looked at it a little bit differently. So I may have a couple of more in there. But the way I look at the buyer process is a little, a little bit different. Maybe it's a little more granular, if you will. So I start off with the first stage of the customer identifying their need or their problem. Right? So they, they internalize exactly what that looks like. But then I go on to think about it in terms of once I recognize that I have a need or I have a problem – Then I'm beginning to look at other influential areas of information or peers and others that can potentially play a part in this decision. I mean, think about it. Every time you're looking for something, sometimes you ask coworkers, sometimes you ask friends, family members, etc. Hey, do you know of a place where I can? Do you know of a good blank, right? Then in the third phase, people kind of go into this knowledge gathering phase, right? They, they, they have a process for how they're going to go about it. Are they going to go on Google? Are they going to be looking for things? Are they going to be traveling to things? How are they going to gather the knowledge they need to make a well-informed decision? The fourth phase is really decision time. It's start to make that decision. But where I kind of differ a little bit from the traditional is that At some point in the decision process, a person begins to set their expectations of the purchase. And this is an important phase because they're starting to envision themselves using this thing that they have to buy or this service that they need, and they start using their imagination to to think, well, what will life be? Or what will my day be? Or how will I do something better with this thing? So there's an expectation level that is very, very important to be thinking about. And then at some point, they actually make the purchase. So that would be the next 
uh, phase. So that would be phase six in my uh, buyer processes. But after the purchase is made, there is a post-purchase phase that that's where you're starting to think whether or not it met your expectations. Was this the right thing to buy? Was it not? Am I delighted? Do I have buyer's remorse, etc.? And then if all things go well, we go into some relationship phase that now we feel kind of tied to or akin to that particular vendor that we found them. We're almost a member of that society that we found the right thing for us. So we start to build this relationship. And that that's an interesting part because at that point, the relationship either results in loyalty or it results in us churning, us leaving that particular vendor. And if it's in loyalty, then we go on to another phase. And that phase is what most businesses call the customer lifetime value phase. So once we made a purchase, we hope, the, the, well, the vendor hopes that you'll go on to make more purchases. You will tell others, your family, your friends will purchase. But ultimately, if you keep coming back for repeat business, you're increasing your lifetime value to that particular business. So if you're all with me still, uh, let's get a little bit deeper. Maybe let's go down one more level in this. So we talked about the customer IDing their needs. But the one thing to think about from your business perspective is how does the customer recognize their need? Let's put that aside for a second. But how does the customer research their options? This is an area that will highlight. So we'll put a, a red mark next to that to say that could be a potential CX leak area. So where and what should be available for them to do that? They also probably think about how does the customer shortlist in a first pass? But another CX leak area is how does the process differ by persona, by personality type, by customer type? Are you addressing all types in your marketing, in your website, in your stores, etc.? So then we talked about a little bit around the, how the influences play a part in this. And those influences come in many shapes and forms. They come in online, they come in offline. But let's, let's talk a little bit about what, what they look like. So they look like testimonials, uh, reviews, authority sites, the top 10 best lists. So those are all experiences that can affect the decision. Then they move on to get influenced by their peers, their family, their friends, their coworkers, their acquaintances. Now, beyond that, we look at other sources, different ads, links, commercials, infomercials, advertorials, editorials, social, PR, ad placements, things of that nature. And then if we go on to how they gather knowledge, well, they gather knowledge in, in multiple ways. So we have to think about what amount of knowledge gathering is done online, which means they're looking at your sales pages, websites, videos, YouTube, Facebook, Pinterest, your social blogs, things like that. So are you where they are? Are you having a presence with the medium that they will most likely use? Important area for potential uh, CX issues. Now, what amount is done manually or in person or via phone? Now, this is another area that maybe if you're a brick and mortar, you're in a, st- you're in a store, you're in a mall, they visit, they make a phone call to you. It could be offline referrals um, or even awareness of things that are happening. And what I mean by that is if you've ever gone by the Apple store during the launch of something, you've seen massive lines. You may not know what was being launched, but you're aware of a trend happening because there are indicators there. Now, we think about all these 
types of areas as we're building up our presence. And how is it different? How is knowledge gathering different and affected by visible trends? Right? So how do we become aware of the trends? You know, what's the speed of awareness? What are the awareness channels? And what's the chance of contributing to a viral growth? So we have to keep all of the the various knowledge gathering areas in mind. Otherwise, we're not doing ourselves a great service moving forward. Then at decision time, a bunch of things have to happen, right? Thinking about really, do we do enough to make the decision easy for them. And this is going to come up again while we during the purchase phase too. But are we providing them everything that they can do for their due diligence? Can we map their due diligence? In that decision time, lots of things are happening, as well as in the next phase of expectations being set. You know, what are those defining moments where, where the prospect is actually envisioning themselves using your product. When are they starting to see what life can be like, what a day in their life could be like using your product? So you're at this point, you need to create a very positive expectation because that builds long-term trust and certainly a relationship. So they color the envisioning based on the expectations that they're starting to formulate and set in their minds. And once they make the purchase, they go one of two ways. Either they're delighted with their purchase, look what I've got, I got a great deal, uh, it was wonderful, they helped me, they were, they, their service was, was phenomenal, uh, it was easy, it was frictionless, all of those types of things, either delight, or the other side of the coin is they've got buyer's remorse. Why did I buy this? Why did I go down this path? This doesn't really make sense. I don't know what came over me, as if they were you know, inhabited by uh, an, another being that made them make that decision. Then they go on to start to evaluate after the purchase itself. And that's where either they're deciding that I'm really happy with this, I'm going to be loyal to this organization as long as I can, or they're going to move to another uh, choice, which means they churn which means no customer lifetime value enhancement. That's an important part because during that relationship phase, that makes or breaks the long term. And in many parts of business, the first purchase is not the purchase that you make your money on. And ultimately, does that relationship go positively so that you, you as a business owner can start to realize the increasing customer lifetime value based on that customer that you spent money to acquire them as a customer. You may have had a lost leader to get them in the door, and you're hoping to increase their amount of repeat business over time because you're going to give them the best experiences um, along each point of the continuum. So, I hope this was helpful to you because it's a it's an interesting question that's been posed to me many times is where where do the problems exist? So I wanted to illustrate this and I also invite you to download the mind map as an example and maybe you could kind of look at that with your business in mind and also understand where the potential customer experience leaks could occur. You've been listening to The Science of CX. My name is Steve Pappas. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. And if you have, the highest compliment that you can give us is to subscribe, rate, and review The Science of CX. Thanks, and we'll see you in the next episode.